Imagine the scenario you've just discovered a major security flaw in your company's system. What's the ethical course of action? The answer to this question unravels the very foundation of what we're going to talk about today. We are about to dive deep into the ocean of security and risk management, beginning with the cornerstone of our discussion, professional ethics. In the realm of information security, ethics is not just a fancy terminology terminology or a philosophical concept. It is far more than that. It's the backbone of trust, the shield of integrity, and the navigational compass that guides our actions. It's the silent force that underlines every decision we make, every action we take. It's the invisible thread that binds us all together in this field, a thread woven with trust, integrity, and responsibility. Our journey in security is not a solitary one. To make sure we all tread on the same ethical path, there exists a body, the International Information System Security Certification Consortium, more commonly known as ISC Squared. ISC Squared has established what we refer to as the Code of Professional Ethics. Now, this code is not merely a checklist of do's and don'ts. It's much more holistic and encompassing. It's a framework, a blueprint that aids security professionals to make sound decisions when confronted with ethical dilemmas. It's a lighthouse, the stormy sea of dilemmas guiding the way for the lost sailor. Let's dissect the four canons of the ISC squared code. The first canon reads, protect society, the commonwealth, and the infrastructure. This principle underlines our duty to safeguard the public and the systems we are entrusted to protect. It calls upon us to be the guardians of society's cyber world, reminding us that our primary duty is to protect and serve. We are the Sentinels, standing at the front lines of cyber defense, holding the shield high against threats and breaches. The second canon beckons us to act honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally. It seems relatively straightforward, but it carries profound weight. It reminds us that our actions must be groomed with honesty, justice, responsibility, and legality. We must conduct ourselves honorably with the highest integrity our profession demands. The third decree states, provide diligent and competent service to principles. This principle nudges us to constantly strive for excellence and professionalism in everything we execute. We are not just professionals, we are the standard bearers of our industry, defining the levels of dedication, diligence, and competence. The final canon advises us to advance and protect the profession. This principle encourages us to be the torchbearers of our profession, fostering a professional environment that promotes growth, respect, and integrity. We must not only protect our profession, but advance it, nurturing a culture of continuous learning, improvement, and respect. Now, let's turn our attention to the organizational code of ethics. While the ISC squared code provides a broad ethical framework, each organization will have its own specific code of ethics. This code is meticulously tailored to cater to the organization's unique needs, challenges, and culture. It's a compass that helps employees navigate ethical dilemmas specific to their roles within the organization and the organization they pledge their service to. Remember, ethical decisions might not always be the easiest to make. They often require courage, integrity, and a deep sense of responsibility. But these decisions are crucial to maintaining trust in this field, building an environment that thrives on honesty, integrity, and professionalism. As we continue to delve deeper into the world of security and risk management, let's promise ourselves to keep ethics at the forefront of our minds. After all, without ethics, what are we securing? What? Ever wondered about the pillars of security? We're about to break them down. Before we delve into the nitty gritty, let's first visualize what these pillars stand for. Picture them like a fortress, protecting your precious treasure, your data. Each pillar holds its own significance and contributes towards robust security. The first pillar we'll be considering is confidentiality. As the term suggests, confidentiality is all about keeping secrets. Secret. It's about hiding your precious jewels in a safe. It's about storing your treasured memories in a diary, tucked away from prying eyes. Now let's take this concept and apply it to the world of data. In this context, Confidentiality is the guarantee that your personal or institutional information is accessible only to those who are authorized to view it. It's about ensuring that your data, your digital secrets are well guarded. Imagine you're a magician. You wouldn't want anyone to know how your tricks are done, right? That's confidentiality in action. The second pillar is integrity. This is the assurance that the data you're dealing with remains accurate and consistent over its entire life cycle. Picture a complex, ancient manuscript. 
The scribes who wrote it would take great care to ensure that every copy made was identical to the original and that no information was lost or altered. They were guardians of information, ensuring its integrity across centuries. Now imagine that you're baking a cake and you decide to follow your grandma's secret recipe. You wouldn't want anyone to meddle with it and change the sugar to salt, would you? That's what integrity in security is all about, making sure the data remains untampered and true to its original form. The third pillar, availability, is just as crucial as the first two. This one is pretty straightforward. It's about ensuring that the data or services are available when needed. Imagine a well-stocked library filled with books. Those books are of no use if the library is always closed. Availability and data security is very similar. Think of it like this. You wouldn't want favorite coffee shop to be closed right when you need your morning caffeine fix. Similarly, in the world of security, we want to ensure that our data and services are accessible whenever they're needed. The fourth pillar of security is authenticity. This is all about being genuine or original. In the art world, authenticity is deeply valued. It's like buying a painting and wanting to be sure it's not a counterfeit. In the realm of data security, authenticity holds a similar importance. We use various techniques to ensure that the data, transactions, and communications are genuine. Authenticity is like a stamp of approval that reaffirms the integrity and confidentiality of data. Finally, we have non-repudiation. It's a fancy term that simply means one cannot deny their actions. It's like signing a contract. Once you've signed it, you can't deny that it was you who signed it. Similarly, in the digital world, non-repudiation provides proof of the integrity and origin of data, ensuring that the parties involved cannot deny having sent or received the data. Non-repudiation, in essence, is an undeniable record of digital transactions. It's like a tangible receipt for your digital interactions, which you can't deny owning. So, in a nutshell, these are the key concepts that form the backbone of security. Keep them in mind as we navigate through this journey. Let's talk governance. Does it sound dull? Not quite so. Is it vital? Undeniably, yes. Governance, especially in the realm of security, is not unlike the maestro of a grand orchestra. Picture this, the violins, cellos, and flutes, each capable of producing stunning music independently. Nevertheless, it's the maestro who masterfully brings them together, orchestrating a harmonious symphony. This symphony is a metaphorical representation of your organization, and the instruments symbolize the various departments that constitute it. When put into the perspective of an organization, we have various departments, all different in their function and purpose. They are like the violins, cellos, and flutes of an orchestra capable of producing results independently, each in their own unique ways. However, without a conductor, without governance, each department might be marching to the beat of their own drum, causing a disarray rather than a coordinated effort. This can result in a chaotic noise rather than a beautiful, harmonious melody. It's a cacophony that lacks the unity and direction necessary for a successful symphony, or in this case, a successful organization. This is where security governance comes into play. Serving as the conductor, the governance aligns security objectives with the overall corporate strategy, ensuring all departments are operating in sync. It ensures that all departments, like different instruments in an orchestra, are not just playing their own tunes, but are working together to create a harmonious melody. The aim is to ensure that everyone is singing from the same hymn sheet, working towards a common goal in unison. However, just as a symphony isn't a one-size-fits-all scenario, neither is governance. This is the point where the concepts of scoping and tailoring become relevant. Scoping essentially involves determining the reach of your security initiatives, while tailoring refers to customizing these initiatives to fit your organization's unique requirements. It's not about forcing your organization into a preset, standard-sized security framework, but rather about crafting a framework that is tailored to perfectly fit your organization's needs and structure. Now let's delve into the notions of accountability and responsibility. These two terms might sound similar and are often used interchangeably, but their meanings are as distinct as salt is from sugar. Accountability is about ownership, responsibility, and answerability. It's the who in the question who will answer for this. It's about establishing who will be held accountable when something goes wrong, who will take the fall. Responsibility, on the other hand, is about action. It's the what in the question what needs to be done. It's about determining the tasks that need to be carried out and who is responsible for executing them. It's about establishing roles and tasks and assigning them to the right people. In the realm of security governance, both accountability and responsibility are crucial. 
we need individuals who will take ownership, be accountable, and ensure necessary actions are carried out. Lastly, let's touch upon due care and due diligence. These two terms are akin to the two sides of the same coin. Due care is about doing what a reasonable person would do in a given situation. It's about taking the right actions, making the right decisions. Due diligence, on the other hand, is about doing your homework. It's about taking the necessary steps to identify potential risks and mitigating them beforehand. It's about doing everything you can to prevent problems before they occur. In essence, Good governance isn't just about ticking boxes. It's about creating a structure that supports a robust security strategy. It's about orchestrating a harmonious symphony where each department plays in perfect harmony with the others, all working towards a common goal. It's about fostering of accountability and responsibility where everyone knows their role and does their part. It's about exercising due care and due diligence to mitigate risks and prevent issues before they occur. And ultimately, it's about leading your organization towards success. Navigating the terrain of compliance can be daunting, but don't worry, we've got the map. It's like embarking on an adventure through an intricate maze, each turn revealing a new aspect that needs careful attention and understanding. We must begin by acknowledging that the concept of compliance is far from being a one-size-fits-all solution. Let's explore what lies beneath the surface of compliance. To start off, it encompasses a whole range of contractual requirements. These are essentially obligations that individuals, corporations, or other entities mutually agree upon. They constitute a broad spectrum from data handling specifications to specific security measures and remain subject to change according to the evolving needs and agreements between the concerned parties. Just as the perimeters of a contract are negotiable, so are these requirements, always allowing for adaptability and innovation. On the flip side, we have legal requirements, uh, mandates set in place by the law. These are non-negotiable rules enforced by legal authorities that govern how we interact with critical assets, such as data protection regulations or cybersecurity laws. These laws vary from region to region, crafted to suit different legal, cultural, and social landscapes. Understanding these is understanding the unique context they've been molded by providing a broader perspective on the necessity and application of compliance. Then we approach the realm of industry standards, which are essentially best practices adopted by organizations within a particular industry. They're the cool kids on the block, trailblazers of the industry. Everyone wants to emulate them. These standards are often the product of years of cumulative wisdom and experience, shaped by the joint efforts of several organizations to create a secure, efficient and inclusive work environment. Adhering to these standards is not just about compliance. It's about being part of an industry-wide movement to improve and innovate. There are also regulatory requirements, directives handed down by regulatory bodies to ensure organizations maintain a certain level of security. They're the strict but caring guardian ensuring we're safe, secure, and doing what's best. These requirements act like a watchful lighthouse guiding us safely through the dark, uncertain waters of our respective industries, eliminating potential risks and encouraging a culture of vigilance and preparedness. Now, let's shift gears and delve deep into the realm of privacy requirements. In our hyper-connected digital world, the importance of privacy can never be overstated. Understanding privacy requirements isn't just about compliance. It's about respecting and upholding the rights and freedoms of individuals. It's about giving due importance to personal data, ensuring it is handled with utmost care, used responsibly, and shared with due regard to confidentiality. Compliance is a multifaceted beast, no doubt. It's not just about ticking boxes or whittling down the potential for fines. It's about being able to understand the essence of these directives, rules, and regulations, and integrating them into your organizational culture. It's about fostering a culture of security and trust where every member understands their role in maintaining and promoting this trust. It's about realizing that in our interconnected digital world, every action, every decision has a ripple effect on the entire network. Organizations need to keep abreast with regulations like the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, guidelines. These regulations provide clear-cut rules for how personal data should be collected, stored, utilized, and disseminated. They require organizations to be transparent and accountable in their practices, reinforcing the culture of trust we talked about earlier. 
In summary, compliance is about more than just navigating a maze of rules and requirements. It's about understanding the spirit behind these guidelines and integrating them into your organization's ethos. It's about fostering a culture that values security, trust, and responsibility. Always remember, compliance isn't just about avoiding fines. It's about building a culture of security and trust. The law and information security, it's an intriguing and intricate relationship. Let's take a deep dive and untangle this complicated web. When it comes to safeguarding valuable information, a variety of legal instruments are available to our advantage. Consider trade secrets, for instance. These are valuable pieces of information for an enterprise that, if known to competitors, would give them a competitive advantage. Trade secrets can include manufacturing or industrial secrets and commercial secrets. The unauthorized use of such information by persons other than the holder is regarded as an unfair practice and a violation of the trade secret. Then we have patents, another significant legal tool. Patents confer an exclusive right to an invention, allowing the creator or owner to benefit from their work. This protection generally lasts for a specific period, usually 20 years from the date of filing an application. Having a patent doesn't necessarily mean the inventor can then exploit the invention. They might need to reach agreements with the patent owners of other related inventions. Then there are copyrights, highly influential in the world of art, literature, and software. They protect original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic works such as poetry, novels, movies, songs, computer software, and architecture. Copyright does not protect facts, ideas, systems, or methods of operation, although it may shield how these things are expressed. Trademarks also come into play when distinguishing the goods or services of one entity from others. These can be any signs, designs, or expressions that identify products or services. Trademarks protect brand names and logos used on goods and services, thus ensuring customer and loyalty. However, the digital realm is boundless, and sharing data across international boundaries can indeed become a legal labyrinth. Different countries, different jurisdictions, and different rules. This is where the understanding of privacy laws becomes paramount. Privacy, in its simplest form, is the right to be left alone. Yet, in the context of information security, it's about safeguarding personal information from unauthorized access or disclosure. Speaking of privacy, let's delve into the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. This landmark EU law has set a new standard for data protection around the globe. It gives control to individuals over their personal data and simplifies the regulatory environment for international business by unifying the regulation within the EU. Also notable is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. This multinational body provides guidelines for safeguarding privacy and transborder data flows, setting a benchmark for businesses and governments worldwide. In a world where data is the new oil, supervisory authorities play an essential role. They monitor whether organizations are adhering to data protection laws and regulations, maintaining the subtle balance between commercial needs and privacy rights. Now let's discuss in detail about data impact assessments and privacy impact assessments. A data impact assessment is a method to identify and minimize data protection risks of a project. It is particularly relevant when new technologies are being deployed, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. On the other hand, a privacy impact assessment is a process to identify and mitigate the privacy risks of new projects or policies. It helps to ensure the protection of individual privacy rights while allowing data required for business operations. Both these assessments are indispensable tools for ensuring that privacy is embedded into the design and operation of IT systems, networks, and procedures from the very beginning. Contribute to making privacy a default feature rather than an afterthought. Legal and regulatory issues in data protection and privacy can indeed be a minefield, but armed with a holistic understanding, you can navigate it with confidence. Risk management, it's the heart of security. Let's dive in. We live in an uncertain world where risks abound. In the realm of information security, risk is a measure of the extent to which an entity is threatened by a potential circumstance or event. It's typically a function of the adverse impacts that would arise if the circumstance or event occurs and the likelihood of occurrence. Risk plays an essential role in decision-making. It helps us decide whether an activity is worth the potential loss. Risk management, then, is the process of identifying, assessing, mitigating, and monitoring risks. 
It begins with risk identification, where we look for potential threats that could harm an entity. This can involve looking at various sources such as historical data, theoretical analysis, informed and expert opinions, and stakeholder input. Once risks are identified, they need to be assessed. This involves determining the likelihood that each risk will occur and the impact if it does. The combination of the likelihood and impact gives us the risk level, which can then be compared against a set of criteria to determine whether the risk is acceptable or needs to be treated. Risk mitigation comes next. This is where we decide what actions to take to reduce the likelihood of the risk occurring or to lessen its impact if it does. Options could include avoiding the risk, reducing the risk, sharing the risk, or retaining the risk. The choice largely depends on the risk's severity and the cost of mitigation. The final step is risk monitoring. This involves tracking identified risks, monitoring residual risks, identifying new risks, and executing risk mitigation plans. Risk monitoring is crucial because risks are not stagnant. They change as the environment changes. Underpinning all these steps is a risk management framework. This provides a structured process for the management of risks and includes components such as risk identification, risk assessment, risk response, and risk monitoring. It also includes communication and consultation, establishing the context, and recording the risk management process. Risk management is not a one-time activity, but a continuous process. It's the heart of security. With a robust risk management framework in place, you can confidently navigate the uncertain waters of information security, making informed decisions that help your organization thrive in a world full of risks. Security awareness and training, the human factor. Let's explore. Security is not just about technology. It's not just about systems, processes, or policies. It's also about people. In fact, people can be the weakest link in any security chain, but they can also be its greatest strength. Human error is a significant factor in many security breaches. This is where security awareness and training comes in. It's about educating people on security threats and teaching them how to respond appropriately. It's about creating a security culture where everyone understands their role in keeping the organization safe. Security awareness is the knowledge and attitude members of an organization possess regarding the protection of the physical and, especially, information assets. It is a crucial element of any organization's overall security strategy. Awareness programs aim at changing behaviors to reduce risk and protect information and systems. Training, on the other hand, is about providing the skills and knowledge needed to perform specific tasks. For example, a system administrator might need training on how to configure a firewall, while an end user might need training on how to spot a phishing email. There are many different types of security training and their effectiveness can vary. Some organizations might offer e-learning modules that employees can complete at their own pace. Others might provide in-person training sessions or even use gamification to make the training more engaging and memorable. But no matter what form the training takes, the goal is the same to reduce the risk of a security incident by making sure everyone knows how to protect themselves and the organization. Fostering a security culture is not a one-time event, but a continuous process. It requires ongoing commitment from everyone in the organization, from the CEO to the newest recruit. It's about making security a part of everyday life and not just something that's thought about during an annual training session. Remember, security is not just about technology, it's about people. And with the right awareness and training, people can become the strongest link in your security chain. Business continuity and disaster recovery, the lifeline. Let's delve into it. While security measures are in place to protect an organization from threats, it's equally important to have a plan for when things go wrong. That's where business continuity and disaster recovery come in. Business continuity is about maintaining essential functions during as well as after a disaster has occurred. It involves ensuring that the business can continue to operate no matter what. This could mean anything from a power outage to a major natural disaster. On the other hand, disaster recovery is a subset of business continuity. It's the process of restoring all critical functions after a disaster. This could include recovering data, hardware, and software, as well as connectivity to outside services. The importance of a business continuity plan and a disaster recovery plan cannot be overstated. Without these plans, a minor outage could turn into a major disruption. A business that can quickly return to normal operations after a disruption will not only save money, but it could also save the business itself.
Developing a business continuity plan requires identifying the most important business functions and processes, then determining what resources are needed to maintain these functions. This could include personnel, equipment, technology, and information. Similarly, a disaster recovery plan involves identifying the IT equipment and systems that support critical business functions. The plan should outline how to recover these systems and resume operations as quickly as possible. Once these plans are developed, they should be tested regularly to ensure they are effective. This could involve testing individual components of the plan, such as data recovery procedures, as well as full-scale disaster simulation exercises. Business continuity and disaster recovery are not just about surviving a disaster, they're about thriving in the face of adversity. With the right plans in place, an organization can weather any storm and come out stronger on the other side. Remember, in the world of security and risk management, preparation is key. So let's stay prepared, stay secure.